I absolutely think this country missed the opportunity to make a real difference in how we treat each other, how we think about each other. And I guess quite honestly, I'm not sure how, to f how it can be fixed. Could they be right? Is there really no way out of this? Will we ever break the chains of our history, learn from it, and use it to right old wrongs? Cousins Tom Duckenfield and Latanya Lawson Jones formed the Nominee Hall Slave Legacy Project. I know that there are thousands of people who are connected to this manumission who haven't had that opportunity, haven't had that experience, and I want them to feel the awe. There are so many people who don't have an idea of what their family heritage is. In America, black people literally have been stripped of the rights of knowing what their background is. It just is not something that we are privileged to have. What I found in my research and with dealing with these families that come from this manumission, all of them have this sense of pride in their family, the sense of pride in themselves, in their work and what they do. We obtain certain advantages from being free peoples. If you look at our family structure, it stayed pretty intact. You know, we had two heads of the household, we had children, people were doing work, they were sustaining themselves. I think that it did in some ways give us a head start in that we had to be self-reliant far long before other people of color were free. That gets instilled into your family. It becomes a part of who you are. You pass that on to your children, to their children, their children, and so on and so forth. The yellow and purple. Yeah. I miss them. I've lost a father through this. Someone that I can't see anymore. Has the shooting affected you? Mm -hmm. Yes, it has. I had to go through a lot of counseling to finally feel like that I turned the corner. Through the years, I'm, I'm getting better, and I think we all are, but it helps by us being yeah. so close-knit. You get them sugar cubes? No. I know Daddy used to get them sugar cubes. I'm going to fight to the end to try to make everybody see what's going on. <laughs> the silence needs to be broken. We can't embed hate into one another. I'm not going to embed hate into my child. I believe that we have very much cornered the market on, on forgiveness, and we've shown it in so many different ways down through the generations. However, the pain is constant, whether you're looking at something that happened on television and, you know, or if you went to the grocery store, Mom and I both have been to two of the popular stores here on the island and have felt, and as Lynn had talked about uh, her experience at the, uh, at the pizza parlor. So, you know, it's not um, that we cannot forgive. It's not easy to forgive. You know, if someone's standing on your foot and they're still standing on it, and every time, again, that wound gets opened when we, Ferguson, yeah, uh, you know, exactly. I mean, right. you know, we all know what's in the, what's in the news. And so it's just a constant reopening of an old wound. Yeah. And um, that we are still just incredibly <sighs> impacted. We need to have an honest conversation. We need to sit down and put all of the issues on the table, not just, you know, the things that are fuzzy and feel good. We need to address the systematic racism that happens in this country. We need to dismantle the institutions that continue to keep 
not just African Americans, but people of color in general, um, subjugated and it's difficult, but it's something that needs to happen. We need an official government commission to investigate and interrogate the lingering impact of both slavery and Jim Crow. Perhaps we need also some way to repair the damage. I would think that the reparations that would be a practical achievement would take the form of refurbishing the black community in terms of the quality of schools and quality of housing, health care of the first order. We found one country where they had the courage to face their racial history and white privilege head on. We'd read that in Uruguay, both black and white citizens are very happy with their democracy. During colonial times, Uruguay was a main entry port for slaves into South America. Uruguay is a country that has had characteristics of conceiving as a country altamente democratic, with signs of equalitarianism very important. Pero cuando empieza a hurgar en su realidad social y comienza a reconocer que no ha sido ni tan igualitario, ni tan inclusivo, ni tan justo, eh, le cuesta mucho, le cuesta aún mucho. El problema que tiene la población negra que al quedar delegada por su origen económicamente en términos estadísticos siempre ha llegado mal, limitada a la enseñanza, a la formación universitaria, etc. Y entonces por ese lado, por el lado social, hay alguna diferencia en contra. Así es que llegamos en el año 2006 a aprobar la primera ley que reconoce la existencia de desigualdades étnico-raciales y encomienda al Estado la realización de acciones afirmativas, estableciendo explícitamente la necesidad de promover la equidad racial y superar las desigualdades que afectan a la población negra. Muy atentamente, firma la señora senadora Constanza Moreira. Se va a votar la licencia solicitada, se está votando. Esas acciones concretas con políticas afirmativas que abren espacios en los empleos, con cuotas específicas para los trabajos en el Estado o en las becas para generar oportunidades de educación, son tan importantes como la posibilidad de permitir a afrodescendientes ocupar espacios en las jerarquías de la administración que son visibles para el conjunto de la sociedad. Tenemos que seguir trabajando para que esas cosas y esos casos no sean excepciones, sino que sean la regla en una sociedad con igualdad de oportunidades para todos. Después está la cultura. Hay personas que discriminan aquí como en cualquier lado. Pero estamos peleando culturalmente contra eso. contemporáneamente tiende 
la tendencia global es de carácter inclusiva. Mandela decía que no había peor mal que la indiferencia. Y yo obviamente considero que la indiferencia tiene un componente fuerte de complicidad que privilegió a la población blanca sobre la población afrodescendiente y que cuesta mucho, porque estamos hablando de relaciones de poder, cuesta mucho reconocer el daño que la población afroamericana ha tenido a lo largo de su historia. Y hay algunas personas, o, o, o muchas personas quizás, que tienen la amplitud y la generosidad espiritual e, e ideológica de reconocer que el otro o la otra también es un sujeto de derechos. No logramos reconocerlo como una persona diferente, pero no, no por eso tiene que ser desigual. So I think people won't get this on their own, that it really takes a lot of work, because this is so deeply in our DNA, and it's reflected in our politics, the way we do politics, the way we do our economy, and the way we think about ourselves. But the hard nut of it is really whites. So we had it exactly backwards, right, in terms of the Negro problem. We have a white problem in the United States, and, we, and, and I don't mean this as a blame and whatever, but we actually need to give birth to a new white identity, a white identity that doesn't need to dominate, a white identity that's not totally angst about being in connection in relationship with the other, a white identity that recognizes that it is the other. The real hard nut is actually white identity itself, uh, and then how that gets manifested in our structures, in our unconscious, in our laws, and in our practices. Yes, sir. But as I go from day